this Sustainable Life Biodiversity and Conservation. This is Michelle Watson. Today is our second conversation with Joshua Spodek. A month ago, he agreed to go and play frisbee twice with a group of friends. And I'm looking forward to hearing him share with us how his new challenge in sustainable living went. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? Good, good, good. So we spoke about a month ago already, I think. And I invited you to commit to a little challenge. Mm -hmm. And I was just being curious, how did it go? I've been on a lot of, I, I, I walk people through a lot of the Spodic method and a lot of people walk me back. So I'm doing a whole bunch of things right now. And I'm trying to think of what I connect, what was the, what did I talk about? I think maybe playing sports and being on the field, running around and how good it felt. Uh, and so the, the, the commitment was to throw a Frisbee in Central Park, if I remember right. It was yes. to, because I did that. And uh, I haven't thrown in Central Park in a long time. I haven't thrown a Frisbee in a long time. And uh, now I did contact a friend. So should I tell the whole story? Yes, please, with pleasure. I'm very curious too. So I contacted a friend immediately after we spoke to see if he would go throw a frisbee with me. And it turns out he's moved to Connecticut. Oh. And, he's, <laughs> he's, and he says, I can't, I'm, I'm not gonna, he's got a family. He's not gonna come in the city just to throw a frisbee around. Yeah. Uh, although he valued, sorry, there's a <laughs> car going outside. I don't know if it came through in the microphone. Yeah, it did. Um, and when I say just to throw a frisbee, of course he and I hold throwing a frisbee in very high regard because we were teammates. And coincidentally, a different friend of mine was coming in from New Jersey and she wanted to get together in Central Park. And so she was like, bring a Frisbee. So coincidentally, a different, you know, I, I don't know whether it was like uh, call it coincidence or karma or whatever, not karma, but. Synchronicity. Synchronicity. Now here's something I'm a little proud of is that I was gonna, it was a really hot day, really hot day. And I was gonna ride my bike up and she was she was driving from New Jersey and I was going to put the Frisbee in a bag and carry that, but it was only the bag. This is such a nerdy geeky thing. And I was trying to figure out, can I not bring the bag? And I'm not going to carry the Frisbee in one hand and ride the bike with the other hand. That was going to be messy. And so I have a, there's a rack on the bike. And so I figured out how to take one bungee cord, which is all the bungee cords I have and attach the Frisbee onto the rack with one bungee cord. And I was really proud of that. <laughs> and so I get on the bike and I ride up there and What's to say? I mean, on the one hand, all we did was throw the frisbee, but she, I think, may have never thrown a frisbee before, frisbee before in her life. So she was like, "How do I do it? How do I hold it? What? How do I stand?" And for those who, for those skiers out there, you know what it's like to go skiing when you're when you know what you're doing and you take someone who doesn't know how to ski. You're just standing around a lot, and yeah. <laughs> it's really annoying. And if it's someone like your child or your nephew, nephew or niece, like I've taking my nephews and nieces out and it's like, oh, they fall and you stand there and wait and they fall and stand there and wait and then they're crying. And it's really, it's really awful in terms of like, you don't get to ski, but if you love that person, then it's really great. So this is a friend and uh, uh, what it means when you're throwing Frisbee on a mildly windy day and it wasn't particularly windy, but it means I'm, I got to chase down a lot of Frisbees because <laughs> she had no aim. And, but I was teaching her like how to hold it, how to, move the shoulder, how to move the weight from one foot to another. And she's like, how do I do it? I'm trying to give her like just enough tips to like give too much and they have to concentrate on too many things at once. And so at first she's kind of struggling, but then after a while, like her throws are getting pretty good and I wasn't having to chase it down so much all the time. And I just, I gotta say throwing a Frisbee is so much, it's, it's like an art. It, the, there's so many different ways you can throw it. To, bank left, bank right, go up, go down, like upside down and all these different ways that um, I feel like a poet, especially like just getting it to do different things. And in her case, I couldn't, she's not running anywhere. So I had to like throw it just to her as opposed to when I'm playing with frisbee player friends and we like run around and we do different things. But yeah, and of course, no shoe. I mean, I, I, I bike in my, in my biking shoes. So they have cleats on the bottom. So I'm, I'm barefoot in the, on the grass in central park in the shade, in the sun. And 
you know, she throws it and almost hits some people and they're like, oh, no problem. And um, I don't know, to, it's just a great, it was just a great afternoon. We didn't do anything. We just threw a Frisbee around. I had this old joke once when I was, not a joke, an actual happenstance that where I was at some Frisbee tournament and um, someone had, had their dog and they were throwing the Frisbee and the dog was catching it. And the dog was running around like crazy and catching the Frisbee and it was really like the dog looked like, was, looked like he was having a lot of fun. And I said, not realizing the context, wow, I, I just wish I could have so much fun like that dog just chasing a piece of plastic around. And I look around, it's like, all these people also chasing the piece of plastic around. Did I tell the story before? I like no, I've told it haven't. recently. And, <laughs> and uh, how much fun we can have just running around. So, so you did get fun out of that, yeah, that then, experience. Yeah. Uh, and then I just walked her to her car and she drove back home and I rode the bike back home, um, got some water, or, you know, refilled the bottle. Cause it didn't just so no one thought I bought a bottle of water. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a bit of interaction with other people, a bit of just sitting also in the sun and in the shade, just looking at what's going on. Uh, yeah. I, I'm thinking about getting into this movie that I, you and I emailed separately about this movie that I saw about uh, the San Bushman in Southern Africa hunting and being in Central Park is hardly, you know, the Kalahari Desert. And I was hardly like digging for food in the ground. And But I wasn't in a building. I wasn't being air conditioned, even though it was hot. And you were running and, barefoot like, like the sun? Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Why is life so complicated? Uh, now I feel like all these people out there like, oh, you're so privileged because people have to work for a living. And they don't get the systemic effect of like, people in the desert live this way and the the average american watches five hours of television a day that's huge yeah and so it, i i saw a breakdown by race so like asian americans is like three african americans is like seven i think and this wasn't time away from work this was time away from tv a, a time away from a screen i didn't bring my computer with me I think I brought my phone with me, but I don't think I, I don't think I used it. Maybe to check the time at some point. I always find it funny how people say they don't have time, but then they always have time to watch TV. It's like, <laughs> um, you, you know, you could like you did, like you did use that time to go out and play in the field in the forest or off screen. Yeah. People are, People don't have time to take the stairs, so they take the elevator and then they also go to the gym. <laughs> People sit on the beach looking at Instagram images of other beaches thinking, I wish I was there. That beach must be better than this beach because I'm looking at it while I'm here. So this one must not be as good. It's like our times. And yeah, I'll admit it was kind of annoying that uh, having to bend down and pick up the Frisbee so many times. But then you realize, what, what else would I be doing? Like, what's better than actively doing something? And would you, would you do it again with other people, maybe? Or was it? So a Frisbee in the park? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's nothing within walking distance for me. I see people throwing Frisbee in Washington Square Park sometimes, but there's not enough space to really air it out. And I can, there's a little more space down by the river, but there's a chance of a breeze taken into the river. So the Central Park is really the closest place. It actually can't be that easy to play Frisbee when there's a crowd around you. I mean, you have to avoid people and trees and, and like you say, there's a wind. Not the easiest. You, yeah, yeah, I mean, it takes skill. If you're playing a, a game of ultimate, you need a field that's roughly the size of a soccer field. Okay. If you're just tossing with friends, yeah, if you're good and you like to throw long sometimes, then yeah, it's, it helps to have a lot of space, but people can be walking around underneath because you can throw around them. Uh, Central Park has, sheep, has Sheep's Meadow, which 
is a big space where people throw balls and footballs and frisbees. So that's mm -hmm. a place where everyone expects people to throw frisbees. If someone gets hit, then I don't, I don't think people get angry. They don't sit near where people are throwing if they avoid, if they want to not get hit. Cause there's some areas where people throw and some areas where people don't throw. Right. And did your friend enjoy it? Did she? I think so. Especially because she got better. All she right. was, at the <laughs> beginning, she was mildly frustrated and feeling like I wasn't giving her enough instruction, I think. But by the end of it, she, yeah, a couple of times, like her form improved noticeably, like instead of lifting the back foot up, she would shift the weight properly uh, the way that I think is the way to throw it. And um, yeah, at the beginning, she would like, <laughs> it just wouldn't go where she wanted to. Yeah, so okay. showing her how to follow through and then it goes where you aim. Yeah, I think she liked it at the end. Well, that's good. And I got to show her when, how I attached the Frisbee to the rack with the one piece of, with one bungee cord. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was curious because you mentioned that you had thought of one person to invite to the park and then he wasn't available and it was this other lady, but how did the whole planning of it, how did you feel? How did I feel about the planning part? Yeah. Yeah, I was enthusiasm tempered with, uh, um, I would say disappointment. I mean, I kind of, I don't like lose, I don't like New York losing a friend to his reason for moving out. Wasn't that he loves Connecticut. It was that New York is, um, a lot of people moving out, uh, all the stuff about drugs and syringes and things like that. That's not a place to raise a family. Okay. And so I didn't like that. Then when my friend invited me and said like, let's go to the park. I thought, yeah, I haven't been out in the park in a while. And one thought was oh, I could get work done in that time instead. And then I can do that work other time. What am I mean, I got, oh man, this reminds me of something when I was in college. We used to tell the, the people on the team, throw as much as you can, practice throwing as much as you can. There were fields in the middle of Columbia's campus that were people throw frisbees. Right. And someone said, yeah, like, for example, if you're walking to class and you got 10 minutes before class, that's 20 minutes of throwing you can get in. <laughs> and when I was a freshman, I would try to get work done on tournaments. We'd go away Friday evening or Saturday morning and come back Sunday night. I never got any work done. And eventually I stopped bringing the books and I did just fine. I think it, I probably did better as a result of the time away from just work, work, work. So the planning, there's a bit of relief when it got taken care of for me. Right. Anticipation of going. Something like that. I mean, it's not the doing, so it's not as deep or rich an experience as the actual spending time on the grass. And once you started with your new, well, not a new friend, but when you started with your friend to teach her and really get into it, um, yeah. you, how did your feelings change then? When you actually had the Frisbee in your hands? Oh, actually Frisbee in the hand. Yeah, there's a, there's a natural feeling of, of um, I don't know how to put it, it comes from mastery of, you know, when you're fluent in something, it just feels good to the motions that I haven't done in a while and they come back in a second. Uh, they don't even come back, they just are there. Right. And um, I kind of feel like after living abroad for a long time, coming back and speaking English nonstop where I was struggling to do something else. It, it feels like coming home, it feels natural, it feels fun. Um, and then now, okay, so now she throws it and I realize how much I'm gonna to have to be walking and picking up Frisbees. Then I'm like, oh, this is gonna be annoying. And it makes, <laughs> but it makes me think of skiing with my nephew or nieces. Um, as she got better, it's kind of, uh, she got better faster than I expected, which was nice. 
uh, when other people were comment when when it almost hit that those other people and they reacted like oh this is in central park like the frisbees come and land near you maybe hit you and i mentioned that she i don't think she'd ever thrown a frisbee before and they're like really i don't know so it wasn't meeting people but it was just you know interacting with people face to face yeah there are people walking around uh there's the guys who walk through selling like ice cold water ice cold beer but they weren't selling water and beer they were selling one of them was selling margaritas in central park <laughs> and yeah so when someone ordered the margarita he goes through the whole show of like he's carrying a, a, a what do you call it like a basket on wheels behind him and in it he's got all the liquors and the cups and glasses and or not glasses because it's plastic so this is what like i'm looking at all the plastic oh my god every single group of people in central park on sheep's meadow every single one of them was eating something and everything was disposable i didn't see anyone bring something from home that they made themselves if there was hummus or tahini or bubble ganoush or whatever some dip it was in a container that they bought at a store with a container that was going to not degrade and poison the world for hundreds of thousands of years no one prepared anything from home no one went without something so yeah i'm i'm frustrated and um what's the word indignant but also determined regarding the litter and the trash but i'm holding myself back from going up to people and saying hey that's a years worth of garbage for me <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't used to be like that yeah I, so i held back on that one and with a frisbee afterwards were you happy or you'll see riding home <clears throat> uh i'm trying to think of myself on the ride home because i'm hot and sweaty uh so the biking makes me both hotter and cuz i have to ride fast so you both hotter and give me a breeze so i come down 7th avenue came home i might have just rested the rest of the day i don't think i was fully exhausted certainly not compared to if i had actually played a game of ultimate on the other hand i'm a lot older <laughs> uh, um i would have come home probably eaten done my calisthenics and burpees and showered and probably rested easy that night i don't remember so much afterward and you think it changed your relationship with your friend having played frisbee with her well it's an active thing to do um i don't think it changed the friendship uh now my friend who moved outside the city now I don't know the next time I'll see him and that's a pretty serious move i mean moving moving is like that's a pretty long term deal and it actually it i don't know if I'm, if i told you i'm talking somewhat with the transition team for eric adams the guy who won the democratic no nomination for mayor of new york city in november is the actual is the full election and he's very strongly favored to win Okay. And it this gave me new impetus and motivation to work with that team if I can to help that administration make New York City a, a leader in this nation and world of acting sustainably which we are not. We're of world capitals we're probably in in the rear. I mean certainly compared to I don't know Amsterdam or Copenhagen we're we're disgusting. and totally entitled to you know all these plastic water bottles I pick up a lot of them are three quarters full meaning the person like pays a dollar two dollars for something that comes out for free out of a water fountain that's right there that if they just went without they'd be fine and the disregard disregarding centuries of people who are going to be living with the poison to say nothing of the animals and plants and fungus that are that have to deal with this poison the plastic and all the pollution that came in its, in in its production and they drink a little, little bit they drink like a few gulps yeah no it would be good if you, yeah if you can get involved and create a bigger change yeah i'd certainly like to see single use plastic to say the least go the way of cigarette smoking in bars and restaurants which is banned and i don't i don't think there's a single person who wants it back 
we used to walk home and you know, you take your clothes off and you're like, oh, the smell of cigarettes. And the next morning I take a shower, maybe that night I take a shower and my hair, the smell would come out of it from the, I don't know, something about the water would make the smell of the cigarettes come out. We used to smoke on airplanes. I mean, forget about the, the, <laughs> the act of lighting a fire on an airplane it was like unthinkable now. The back of the plane would be the smoking section and the front would be the non-smoking section as if the smoke particles would go halfway up and say, oh, I'll turn <laughs> back around now. The whole thing is a smoking section. Once one person at all smokes and once one person smokes and everyone who smokes wants to smoke. And that was our world. That was totally acceptable and even desirable to lots of people. Totally unacceptable today. Yeah. And I was actually wondering, sorry, because you mentioned you gave workshops to kids. Yeah. And how, how yeah, but how did the children react? Do they seem to be more aware and more sensitive to it? Or like what was their reaction to to picking up biggest, litter and, and pollution, all of that. The biggest effect that I saw was how much more the litter there was than they expected. If you don't look for litter, it's easy not to look for it and just put it out of your view, figuratively, if not literally. So we'd be walking along and I'd say, oh, there's a can over there. And they wouldn't notice it until I pointed it out. Then once they started seeing it, they'd start seeing a lot more. And this is in Union Square, which has a lot less than Washington Square Park. If we went to Washington Square Park, it'd be another story. Plus in Washington Square Park, there's so many of the drug users and hopeless people that a lot of the waste is not just a discarded can or bottle, but um, I mean, the syringes, of course, uh, they're a little more rare, but there's like, it's a different class of stuff. Like people just discard clothing and I don't know what happens, how this comes to be. And the places where the drug users are, the heavy drug users, the, the crack and heroin, it's just a different, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's like a drug den. So, and, and meanwhile, I mean, people are walking through it, like as if, as if, I don't know what they're, I, I don't know. Uh, Sounds crazy. It's a really uncomfortable non-equilibrium. In any case, with the kids, we weren't there. We were in um, Union Square, which isn't the cleanest park in the world, but is more clean than that. So there it's mostly people drop in their soda cans and doof wrappers. You know, there's a McDonald's around there. There's a Starbucks. These are just places that produce pollution. And so then, but then there was a fun aspect to it because they're like, they're not seeing it like poison. They're not seeing it like, an entitled culture sinking itself into depths like I am seeing, and nor are they seeing it as like an opportunity to lead the world. They're just seeing it like, oh, wow, it's like a treasure hunt, except anti-treasure. <laughs> so they're like jumping, once they started getting into it, they're jumping around and like climbing over each other to find more and more litter. The, and then when we got to the compost, there's an, and, and where we drop it off, there was a lot of, um, like what's recyclable and what's not recyclable and why and what can go in the compost and what can't go in the compost. So, and I had them ask the compost, the, the people in charge of the composting space, like can the napkins go in, can paper go in so they can find these things out. So it was fun. I think they weren't like, it wasn't as much fun for them as, I don't know, playing, playing ball. Yeah. But I think finding out that there is seeing as much litter as there is even in a place where it isn't nearly as much as in other places. And of course, this is tragic to anyone else, to an adult who recalls a time when there was less litter because when I grew up, there was litter, a lot less, a lot less of it plastic. And that means that my adults, when I was a kid, saw more pollution. And so what was normal for me was abnormal for them. And we see the increase. So what's normal for these kids is a lot of litter. That means that their kids are going to see like a litter, the a litter on a level that would be unthinkable to my parents, unless we act, right? Unless we take responsibility for this stuff and and not say, oh, governments, corporations, you know, they're the only ones that can make a difference. The, the thing is, I think if you've spent your whole childhood noticing a lot of trash and you think that's normal. 
maybe they first have to be exposed to a place where there's zero trash to be shown this is how it's supposed to be before so that they really experience the difference of oh this is how it can and should be and we are currently living in a dump so that they they kind of get not shocked into it but do you understand what i'm trying to say yeah i guess so uh, you know i focus on adults because uh, adults are so quick to say oh the youth will fix our problems and i can't stand that because that's abdicating responsibility for what they've done and kids don't own corporations kids don't they don't run for office and, and hold offices so if we wait for kids it doesn't make any sense that's just not acting so I'm, I'm i hope that a lot of people do work with kids but it's not my focus i want to work with the adults that manufacture that built the factories that manufacture these wrappers and, and refine the oil to make the plastic and that's who I focus on. So I'm happy to do this because it was my, my one-time yoga teacher organized this and she does, she works with kids with this organization that she created. And so when she invited me to do it, I'm like happy to do it. Yeah, sure. But I would much rather do the same thing with CEOs of corporations. I like to see some CEOs of corporations get down on their hands and knees and pick up some garbage, especially the stuff that they produced. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd much rather see that than the kids doing it. Well, ideally, it would be good if everybody just became a part of it. Yeah, well, the CEOs are the last ones to act, it seems to me. They're like, oh, I'll appoint a sustainability committee in there, and now I'm done. Yeah. I want to change that to genuine, authentic action, systemic change that begins with personal transformation. It's not something you can farm off to somebody else or wait for another generation. We've been doing that for a long time, and it's clear the direction of all the indicators are going in the unhealthy direction. Carbon dioxide up, plastic up, population up community sense down waiting is exacerbating the problems it seems to me my goal is to get the ceos the celebrities yeah i mean everyone thinks oh dicaprio goes speaks to the un what a great thing to do i'd like to see him posting pictures of him picking up garbage I think that would be a lot more effective. Uh, if, he, if he does it as a clear photo op, I don't think it'll be effective. If he also shares himself and shares where it's coming from, and he's doing it because if he shares where the motivation is coming from, and he's not trying to say he's perfect, he's not trying to say like, oh, look what I'm doing, I'm so great, you should follow. If, he, if it comes out that he really cares about it, if he doesn't care about it, I don't want to see him do it. Yeah, it's got to be maybe, intrinsic. Yeah, maybe he believes that you know, plastic is, is really so useful, it's worth, the, it's worth it. In which case, I, it doesn't make sense for him to do something he doesn't believe in. But if he believes that this stuff is choking us and he wants to get a sense of like how, what's the situation like, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, maybe you'll get him on one of your next shows. <laughs> yeah, if he's lucky. Or, I mean, I hope he figures it out on his own without me. But if he doesn't, I'm happy to help him. Well, what do they say? There's a six degrees of separation? Early on, uh, the DiCaprio Foundation, there was a guy there that, I don't know how we got in touch, but we were communicating. He's since left that position, but they, they retweeted a bunch of my tweets. So the DiCaprio Foundation, the foundation he, he began to um, work on sustainability issues or environmental issues. So I was in touch with them a bit and they did support me in the sense of, of publicizing podcast episodes and posts. Okay. But then the person who was there left and I didn't get put in touch with the next person. Yeah. So it's one degree of separation. I presume that the person I worked with worked directly with him. Oh, that's excellent. So I think maybe you just have to get in contact with them and remind them that all it takes is going to a park and throwing frisbees and enjoying nature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the action, where it comes from, the sharing is important. I think people, it has to be authentic. 
I mean, plastic is still plastic. Yeah. Someone sent me actually a link about some wooden Frisbees. Was that you? Okay, sorry. Yeah, it was yeah. me. Okay, that, that's why I said, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so someone is throwing a wooden Frisbee. That was for Frisbee golf as opposed to Frisbee ultimate. Yeah, so I don't know there. the difference. I'm not that educated in Frisbees. Oh yeah, that's um, golf discs are designed for accuracy and to throw around different, like they, they curve in different ways in their flight. So that sometimes they go left and sometimes they go right and sometimes they go flat and sometimes they go far. Okay. Whereas a disc for ultimate, I don't know what, there's just one that the disc craft is like the one that everyone uses. It's the most fun to use. Could that be made out of wood? I was just wondering about when I saw that that wooden frisbee and I thought, well, it's nice if you want to be precise and aim for specific targets, but would you really want to be on the receiving end of one of these and <laughs> catch them? And I was thinking, I think, yeah, even though we're not pro plastic, I think to play, I think I'd be happier trying to catch a softer plastic frisbee than a hard wooden one. Yeah. I don't, my mind is now thinking of like what materials, you know, just got to get a rubber tree and figure out how to make some sort of natural. I mean, I know they make, pla yeah, they make plastic out of plants now, but you, it can still become something that doesn't biodegrade and doesn't, that it's still poisonous just because it's made from plants. Doesn't mean it's not, doesn't have all the problems of regular plastic yeah. or it'll, it'll not have some of the problems, but it, it might not, it might still have all the big ones. So I don't know enough about plastics to talk about that. <laughs> but I, I can tell you, I've not bought a new Frisbee. This is one I have, the, the only one I have left is, it's from Summer League 2015 when we won. And oh. I used to have dozens of other Frisbees which have just gone to various places over the years. Now I just have one left and I'm not gonna buy a new one because it's plastic. Okay. So I was going to ask you, um, about whether you would continue with the frisbee playing with your friends, but if you only have one frisbee, that might have a limited. Well, I'm too old to play ultimate. I mean, I know people over 50 who still play, uh, but I mean, if invited to play some Masters Masters game, I I would. And maybe if I were in, an, when I was in Shanghai, when I was in France living there, just find frisbee players and like you got a community right there. That's really cool. So if I'm if I lived somewhere overseas, then I would almost certainly connect with the frisbee community just to toss around a bit, just to connect, because that's really great. It's a very welcoming community. Community, but to play, I'm not going to play competitively again. Um, then, but I do have this frisbee, and eventually the plastic gets old and cracks. So once this cracks, I don't know what I'll do. But until then, I'm I'll, I'm happy to toss. So anyone who's listening to this, if you're in New York and want to go toss a disc with me, then, you know, get in touch with me and, and I'll go. You know, if it's like February, I might not go as, as quickly. And we can also get some famous no packaging vegan stew. People invited, to, I invite people to invite me to join them with that. Sounds like an excellent thing to do. And um, I like it. <laughs> well, I hope that you continue enjoying your frisbee and your non-packaging stew. When I first ask people, when I first invite people to act on their environmental values, almost everyone thinks they jump to what is necessary to save the world. And so they start thinking, well, I can't institute a carbon tax globally on my own. I can't, you know, all by myself, put up wind farms. I don't see what I can do. I'm already doing the things I can, I compost and I recycle. And it's easy to look at these little things like throwing disc in the, in the park once as what is that? But that to me is like looking at someone, a great, I don't know, piano player playing scales and saying, why bother playing scales? That's not really music. That's not what, ha no one goes to Carnegie Hall to see you play scales. Why are you playing scales? Well, of course, you got to play your scales to get to Carnegie Hall. That's how you get there is practice, practice, practice. And when we get, one of the big things that I'm trying to get to people is that these little things are the scales, but unlike 
piano scales were, I don't know, when I was a kid, I had to play violin. And I remember times when my mom would, I'm, she's sitting at the piano, I'm sitting there playing the violin and tears streaming down my face because I do not want to practice. And now something in nature, everyone can find something in nature that's not only not tearful or tears of joy, they could, there's, that is as wonderful as anything in life. They, ha they have the opportunity to experience. And to think that it's not worth doing because it's not gonna fix all the world's problems, just your actions overnight, does not mean it's not worth doing. On the contrary, the fastest, most effective way to get to effective action on a global scale to change systems is the personal interaction, is to find that joy. If you really don't think there's any joy worth having in nature, I don't know, I guess like let, watch it burn enjoy watching it burn and and but i don't think there's anyone out there like that and the more time in nature however trivial by the measure of the effect on the world if it's resonating with your intrinsic motivations what you value what you find purposeful that's the most effective way to get to making a difference and you'll inadvertently lead others, whether you mean to or not. You'll also develop the skills to do more. And you'll help Bangladesh more by going to the park than by not going to the park. We're not disconnected from nature. We never were and we never have been. And to act like we are is on a global scale, it's like admitting we've lost, but on a personal scale, it's missing out on Everyone gets mind, body. Too much mind, not enough body, you're out of balance. Too much body, not enough mind, you're out of balance. There's another leg to that stool. Some would put spirit or God in there. Nature is another part. Nature is a part of that stool. And you take that, that leg away and the stool doesn't stand. As it happened for all of history, all of human existence, going back long before history, you couldn't walk around without walking through trees. You couldn't. Only in the past generation or two, you can walk around a city and never see a tree. You know, New York, we've got some, nothing like that. What used to be here, fewer and fewer all the time. Contact with nature is essential to me, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for reminding everyone to yeah spend time in nature. Uh, maybe you want to remind the listeners where they can find you to listen to your podcasts and read your articles. Yeah, so there's joshuaspodek.com, J-O-S-H-U-A-S-P-O-D-E-K.com. And in the upper right corner is podcast and contact connect. So, you know, if you want the famous no packaging vegan stew or to toss in the park, that's how to reach me or social media. It's at Spodek on Twitter. And I don't know what it is. There's not a whole lot of Spodeks around for the others. Uh, don't worry, I'll put the links. I'll put the link on on the page. But yeah. thanks oh, very much you, for Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now, if, if you go to if you find me on online on videos, then you can see my TEDx talks. Yes, and I agree, they're excellent. You should all listen to them. Oh, what's my word against yours? <laughs> well, thanks a lot for today, Josh. I hope you have a really good time. Thank you. <laughs>